Hi everyone, I'm Dan Troxell and you've joined us for another Art Week TV arts interview. Today I've got Becky Beckett. Welcome. Hey, hey everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so Becky, uh, tell me about your art. About my art, wow. Um, okay, so I have actually only recently started practicing again, um, having moved from the UK nearly two years ago now. Um, prior to that, my practice had pretty much been completely sedentary because I was running several businesses. I've been back to college to restudy, to um, learn a new craft. Um, so art was kind of on the back burner for me. Um, I think the last time I practiced was maybe 2014. So quite a while. Um, so my work now, where I'm at now, is I'm working predominantly within drawing and collage at the moment, but as I have recently moved, I am in the very fortunate position of having a studio for the first time in 15 Great. years. So That I must be thrilling. It is. I feel, I, I, seriously, I feel so grateful and it's a bit overwhelming to have that space. But it is incredibly exciting to think where that might go. Um, and I was down there the other day and my cat came down and sat in my chair that I had down there. And I thought, you know what? This is the dream. I have a studio and my cat has come and fallen asleep in the chair in the studio. What more do you want? You know, that, that would be cat art, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So that must be thrilling to have a, a focused studio space that you can go and channel your energies in um, without being disturbed and just leave your stuff there when you leave and all that kind of stuff. That sounds yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, to actually make a mess and not think I've got to tidy this up because it's my kitchen table, essentially, like, you know, the, the, when I was practicing up until, like I say, um, 2014, um, and yeah, I mean, my office was my sort of art studio as well at that point and, and my kitchen table. So my work was much more controlled. Um, and there was a lot less of it because of that as well, because it was, you know, a workstation for many reasons. So uh -huh. I feel like hopefully this means that some decent productivity will come out of having that space where I can just leave it in a total mess, you know, good deal really nice and thrilling about going down there and just seeing a sea of mess everywhere it's, you know it's just nice <laughs> do you think do you think most artists are chaotic because i i think of all artist studio that i've ever seen has been chaotic so i guess i just answer my own question <laughs> <laughs> artists are chaotic yeah i think we are but i think i don't know i mean i wouldn't say i know i'm pretty certain i'm not ocd i like order to chaos um but also when i feel like the work is has got a bit of an ebb and flow to it then actually leaving the chaos as it is it kind of feels like if i was to go and tidy it up then it might disrupt that flow so yeah. i try to not interfere with that too much when i'm kind of feeling like i might be onto something and then maybe occasionally after a few weeks, I'll be like, right, this is just a mess now and I have to reorder things so I can kind of start over again. So, so do you think it's like an outside energy that really controls that or controls your creative process or just the opposite? Um, I don't, I, 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 I would, I don't, I think because, I mean, because it's an enclosed space, I kind of feel like it, it it's just, it's there, there, there doesn't, it is kind of having like, I, I, I feel like I'm a little kid going into my very own den and okay. it just feels like it's my space for me. It doesn't matter what goes on down there. And there is, yeah, I, I don't feel like there's too much kind of like coming into that space and sort of interfering if you like too much. So it's, yeah, there's something nice to that. So I am remembering the time when I met you and Douglas for the first time. It was down at our terrarium. And yes. actually it was your anniversary too. I'm going to remember that. Um, but the question I asked you at that time was, what is art? 
Okay, yeah. So for me, I kind of feel like it's just an expression of something that is within you and, and something that just needs to come out. And that sounds quite a, quite cliched when you sort of hear it out loud, but I think most artists would agree that that to a certain extent is, is what art is. You know, it, it's, we all have our own personal interests and things that we are kind of drawn to. We have our own fight, I'm sure going on within us with different things and some, and they just come out in different ways. And I think, you know, like for musicians, it's music and performers, it's performance. Um, and for artists, it's art, you know? Um, yeah, that's a very cliched answer, but yeah, that's my answer. Well, uh, it, <laughs> it, it might sound that way just because you're saying it, but still, I mean, the, that I have asked a lot of people that question and it's kind of a universal truth mm. that obviously it is an expression. Um, I mean, you can, I don't know how you can make it much more than that. Um, other than the ideas that you have going on in your head when you're doing that, because that's really, that's the filter that's going into it, I think. Um, so, okay. So do you think there's, I mean, you're talking about um, musicians and other practices um, it's all an art of some kind and there's some good music and there's some bad music and that's my opinion But so what do you think is there is there bad art or is it just a different preference? Well, yeah, I'm sure there is bad art, but I think bad art is to is is totally a, a individual preference, you know, um, I think um, it's very interesting to discuss different tastes with people. I think a lot of what we're interested in comes down to different tastes. I mean, uh, we're all interested in different ideas um, and that can be concept, the concept of something or it can be something in its, you know, aesthetically as well, you know, okay. and I think we, we all have a different way of seeing things. So, you know, I, I, I think it's relevant to the, to the viewer. If, if you know totally you know sure so i'm really looking forward to seeing what you are going to do now that you've got your studio space um pressure so <laughs> 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 um do you do you have any contemporary influences on your art i do people um, or ideas or or whatever poets i don't know I don't read so much. I like the idea of reading and, um, but I listen to a lot of audio because uh -huh. I, I struggle with reading, uh, physically. Um, I don't have dyslexia, but I have dyspraxia, which is sort of a bit of a spin off to that, um, struggle with focusing on words and such on the paper. Um, but I love listening to audio, uh, podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts at the moment. Um, I actually, they accompany me working most of the time at the moment. Um, it's quite a nice way to withdraw um, completely from the world and just focus on, on things. Um, yeah. I, you do uh, that while you're working at your art? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, I do. So the you... majority. I, I do like listening to music. I love music, but I quite often find that if I put music on, I generally just want to dance. So oh. <laughs> I have a few albums that I call good working albums, like uh, concept albums, if you like, that are kind of like stories. So they kind of work really nicely um, to listen from start to finish without having to go, I don't like that song, let's flick through that. I don't, you know, and it's a distraction. So there are a few albums like that, but mostly I, I like the spoken word because I think it's much more calm. Um, it has a gentler rhythm to it. So, so yeah. I find so, it okay. So you said spoken word, you mean the, the term spoken word, like poetry spoken word, or you mean listening to like podcasts? spoken word. so li listening to podcasts okay. generally but there okay. are like a bit like i say there's a there's a few albums that i like that are a bit more sort of gentler um or maybe because of the, their conceptual nature they have a bit more of an ebb and flow with the story so you kind of feel like you can listen to them from start to finish and they're not too disruptive um or they're ones that generally speaking i don't want to get up and dance to because i find that is really disruptive because generally speaking i just like to dance a lot mm -hmm. Like right, in my head. So, 
Um, so what are you listening to now these days? Oh, so um, I have discovered recently a fantastic art podcast called Talk Art, which is actually a British um, podcast. Uh, and I don't even know how, oh, I know how I came across it. It was, um, so art critic Jerry Saltz, who has recently released a book called How to Be an Artist. And I think it must have been through his Instagram page that he mentioned that he was going to be on this podcast. And I thought, great, I'll listen to that. Mm. And then I, off the back of that, discovered this fantastic podcast. So I've basically been listening to their back catalogue since that moment. Um, and they um fantastic they have amazing interviews they're about an hour long um and they don't just have a uh, visual artists but they also have had some musicians and they have performers and playwrights and fashion editors and all sorts of uh, people they talk to and they're still keeping it going even though they're under quarantine so that is i'm finding really nice to listen to whilst i'm you know, working and quite often I, I have to stop and just like make notes of like who they're talking about because quite often, you know, it's like, oh, I must check out this person, you know, they sound really interesting. So yeah, um, tangents. <laughs> but um, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah, definitely um, that. Um, oh, what else am I listening to? I tend to pick up on little bits and pieces. I think that people, I think like I was saying, like I came across the art talk because of Jerry Saltz talking about it. So that's generally how I pick up on podcasts unless someone um, sort of suggests something to listen to. Um, so yeah, that, but I would say that that is definitely my favorite podcast at the moment. And they've got quite an extensive back catalog because I'm quite late to the game with them. So I'm, slowly getting through them bit by bit so, yeah. and, and i have a confession to make i almost never listen to podcasts i'm always listening to music so we're we're polar opposites in well, that regard. Thing to me. i mean I have to say, it's, it's a relatively new thing i've not um, yes. i think it's it's pretty much literally the last month or so really i've started listening listening to them um because I've, I've always loved listening to music, but as I say, I, I started, I found that it can be quite disruptive with making, with the exception of the odd album. Sure, um, yeah. But I loved, I love drawing to, um, say, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. I love working to that album. Um, Captain Fantastic by Elton John is also another great album that I find really easy to work to. Um, yeah, they're two of my favourite concept albums. I like drawing to so yeah great um, i think did i actually answer your question i think I, you asked me artists the part the podcast that you're listening to i was curious what what influenced you your contemporary influences and that's yeah you did but, um i i have artists that um that i'm obviously inspired by uh i would say uh, I don't know. Do you, do you want to go off on this tangent? Should I should I talk a few about a few people that I'm interested in? Yes, absolutely. And it's not a tangent. We're totally on track, right? Cool. We're talking about art, <laughs> so we're on track. Well, <laughs> they are. I would say, like, if I want to talk about a few of my favorite artists, I don't, I don't, I won't delve into too much sort of history. I think it's pretty obvious who one of my favorite artists is from the t-shirt that I'm wearing but we don't need to go there today but um uh so um actually a couple of my favorite artists are uh artists that came out of what was known as the young British artists so the YBA period which predominantly started in the late 80s um and they sort of came to quite prolific fame in the early 90s through a series of exhibitions that were put on in London um, and these artists were students at the time um, and they be, kind of came famous because they kind of started doing it their own way. Um, at that time I was in school so I wasn't aware of this but when I was sort of just starting going to art school myself they were kind of getting pretty famous by this point so I sort of I think I really sort of latched onto that because it was happening at that moment. Um, but a couple of the artists from that period have really kind of stuck with me in terms of what what they 
produced and are still going today, you know. Um, so Tim Noble and Sue Webster are a collaborative couple um, and they were actually a couple for quite a long time as well. Um, they, I don't know if you're familiar with their work, but they were most famous for creating light sculpture pieces, uh, but also, and things that I'm probably in love with the most that they've made is their trash sculptures. So they made mm. sculptures out of piles of trash, but into silhouettes of either self portraiture or landscape. And the thing was that they were, you know, these physical sculptures, but then they had light, uh, then they had light projected onto them. So they became also silhouette images on the walls as well. And I love the, the duality of the pieces, but also it's just my love of trash as well. And that complete plastic and rubbish aesthetic that I really love. So they're definitely a favorite couple of mine. Um, also from that period, Sarah Lucas is an absolute favorite of mine too. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her either, but um, most famous for a piece called Two Fried Eggs and a Kebab that was made in the early <laughs> 90s, which was literally a table with two fried eggs and a kebab on it, which represented the female body. Um, and she has since made loads of work with mattresses and, and fruit and found objects and has a fantastic British sense of humour um, with how she plays with a certain imagery and uh, the, the, the sort of role of sex in society and the crudeness and, um, but keeping things really simple um, there's something really pleasurable in the simplicity of her work. But then recently, also as well, she's been creating beautiful bronze sculptures, um, casts of these tights, uh, sculptures that she made that kind of flop over chairs and, and uh, essentially like hookers. They're kind of representative of easy women, if you like. Um, so do you see a divergence? in her style between those two things no I think well I think um because like we're, yeah we're talking you're going to say aesthetic right and, yeah and I mean about aesthetics and and if you can be true or dishonest to your aesthetic well I think they're actually very different but also very the same because um, the materials that she uses in those pieces can be incredibly dif different. Um, so I know that recently, I know at the moment she has a show in London, which sadly I don't think has actually been open to the public because of the pandemic, but you can view it online on the website mm -hmm. um, at her gallery, Sadie Cold. And she has created more of her uh, tight sculptures. So the sort of, if you like... Uh, the lesser, uh, I don't want to say lesser material, but the cheaper material, if you like. So the actual tights that are stuffed, um, you know, as, as opposed to the overly, you know, the beautifully slick and shiny bronzes. Um, but I think there's, there's I, I see that they have beauty at the same level. I think you can see that maybe the the materials might maybe give it a different edge, but I actually see the um, the the, tra the trashier ones, if you like, just as beautifully and as aesthetically pleasing as the shiny bronzed ones. Um, and equally, I feel like the bronze ones haven't sort of left the the nature of the sort of lesser material, if you like, either of the earlier ones or, you know, the other style. Um, I think, you know, they're very much the, the same work, but also different. And it's interesting, you're talking about the trashy style. And I think about uh, one of the, well, I think you have a remarkable vision. Um, and I, you may not be aware of it in this regard, but I've always been really impressed with the the collection of photographs that you've taken 
at some of these stores with these little plastic things like of, of I don't know, kitschy Americana kind of um, whatever, a whistle or a yo-yo or, or whatever that's got some brightly colored thing that, um, you know, they're just, they're amazing. Thank you. And it's that, that collection of them, and it's the juxtaposition of all those together that really makes the, you know, the bigger, bigger picture for it, I think. But yeah, I just got a flash of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of drawn to things, predominantly that are plastic and bold and in your face and have that pop uh, aesthetic, if you like. Um, and I can't help but photograph that. I, I don't see myself as a photographer. I'm pretty certain I would probably not exhibit those photographs as photographs. I I kind of take them with the intention of maybe using them or hopefully using them in some way at some point, maybe within my drawing and collage work. Um, but I just can't help but take photographs of all these things. It's just, I'm just drawn to all these things. Doug mm -hmm. hates going to the supermarket with me because he's like, <laughs> he knows it's always going to take like probably half an hour longer than it needs to because I'm busy taking a photograph of every sweet packet of a particular, especially with all the, the different um, occasions that go on with Valentine's and Easter. Oh and, yeah. I was just going to say around the holidays, you must go. Yeah. There. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I have to go shopping on my own on those days sometimes. Um, I've, I'm missing that at the moment, actually. It's probably, I don't know, it's, pro it's probably saving me an awful lot of time, but with the pandemic, I'm not hanging around in the supermarkets so much. But you're not buying them though. You're just recording them, right? I mean, because no. that would be a problem if you're buying them, because you need to have you have to figure <laughs> out what to do with them all. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I poor do, Doug. <laughs> yeah, well, poor Doug. Uh, also, I, I don't have the finances. I think when it comes to the food stuff as well, fortunately, I actually can't eat a lot of the stuff that I'm drawn to, so that stops me from buying it. Um, in terms of the plastic toys and those sort of things, I. Uh, it, it's a very sort of torn existence in that respect because I know how, you know, bad those things are for the environment mm. and how poorly, you know, I mean, that, that is, that's another thing in itself because that is the subject matter. Um, but yeah, no, I can't, I can't be around, physically can't be around that much crap, <laughs> you know, all the time because, you know. <laughs> so, Okay, so there's the lead in there. So tell me about Crapopolis. That's your Instagram name. Yeah, so Crapopolis. Yeah, when <laughs> <laughs> this is where all the crap is, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Crapopolis. So that um so my Instagram tag, yeah, Becky Becker and Crapopolis. So when I left the UK, uh, my Instagram tag was completely different because it was geared to my fitness business. Um I can't actually remember what it was called. So, um, which is good. Uh, so I changed it. I didn't really know what to call it. Crapopolis is a word that stuck with me for probably about 15 years now. Um, it is the name of my city, basically. So when I was finishing university, I had my first solo show in Oxford and that was an installation uh, and the title of that was Crapopolis. And that was basically me making this immersive space that I considered uh, almost like it being a city that you could enter. Um, and the Crapopolis came from the crap. So here I'm thinking uh, crap is very much in the UK, a throwaway term for junk or trash, as I think you more popularly call it here. Um, the pop coming from my um, probably obsession, I think is, is right really of popular culture and all things bright and plastic and in your face. And then obviously the opolis being the city, the metropolis. So yeah, and I was kind of um, thinking, you, know, you get that thing of like when you've, you've created something when you're younger or you're just starting out, there's very much that thing of, 
uh, oh, you know, shouldn't I maybe distance myself from something that I made when I was that young, you know, shouldn't I be moving forward and growing in my practice? And that's one of those things that I was just like, no, because I love that word and that city is mine. And I still feel like my work is creating a space um, in a sense. It's creating spatial experiences. It's very much still made of those three compartments that make up the name of it. So it, it's no, that, that's sticking that, that I'm, I'm with that, that that's the one thing that I'm willing to take forward with me. Although yeah. <laughs> I had yeah. to inform a few people when I moved here because I changed it. Um, and because some people weren't aware of my art background, even people who look in the UK that didn't know about my art background, um, they thought that I was referencing that I was unhappy about moving to America by saying they thought that I was calling my experience here as being crap. So I had to explain to a few people, no, that is, <laughs> is not my feeling. <laughs> um, so being here. <laughs> were you were you happy to leave London? Yeah, I mean, we've we had some discussions about this and I was curious. I mean, I was I was in London a few years ago and I loved it and I didn't want to leave. And and here you are. You wanted to get out of there. But um, what? tell me about that. Why? Well, OK, so we lived in uh, the outskirts of London. So it was a commute town um, and it was pretty dull. Um, we went into London quite often. Um, I have to admit the sort of like the further distance I got from graduating from art school, the less I went. Um, I think that was partially because of distancing. Well, no, I wasn't intentionally distancing myself from art. Um, it just naturally happened, as I say, with like changing businesses and stuff and and I did exhibit for a few years in London with a uh, with a gallery collective. Um, but it was, the traveling was quite difficult um, into work, uh, into London with work. Uh, it was expensive. Um, not that you necessarily expect, as we all know, to make art uh, and make a living out of it. Um, but then when it starts going in the other direction and you end up spending way more, then it can become a bit, it's a decision you have to make, and I didn't have the money to expend on it. Basically. It's expensive living in the city. Yeah. Um, trying to get and, into the city. And I, but I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think London is a wonderful city. There's so much going on. Um, obviously, there are, it's, you know, there's tons of fantastic art galleries and museums. Um, but I always, I, could, I got to the point, a, a day there was enough. A couple of, you know, I would only ever go up a handful of days a year in the end because it I just is exhausting and it's way too many people, way, way, way too many people for my liking. I'm, I'm not great with huge amounts of people. Yeah, so it's, it is a real polarity here. Do you think that, um, you know, living in Des Moines has changed your aesthetic? I'm sure it's changed your life in, in many ways, but do you think yeah, it's I mean, that's changed like, that's how you look at art? So. Oh no, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I loved, I loved Des Moines. I love the size of Des Moines. I love the fact that I can literally walk around Des Moines in an hour or two if I want to, um, which is when we were living downtown that first 10 months we were here and we were in the apartment um, before we were able to buy. Um, that's what I would do every morning at 6 a.m. was go and walk around the city for an hour, hour and a half. And I loved that. I loved the fact that I could explore pretty much one length of the city to the next if I wanted to within that space of time. Um, but for me, that kind of, so I am actually a country girl. So I was brought up in the countryside in the UK. Um, I was brought up in a tiny village outside of a seaside town. My grandparents were farmers. So I very much see myself as a country bumpkin, if you like. Um, so, and I went to art school in a small city called Canterbury, which was, I, I had to get a bus for an hour to go to that. Um, and that city is probably actually the same sort of size as Des Moines. So hmm. it's kind of, it kind of reflects that for me. And 
that's enough for me. That's big enough for me. You know, um, I love the bigger cities. I love visiting them, but living in them is just like, no, nah. I'm kind of, right. I'm happy with small city because I think of my, my smaller upbringing, if you like, I, I do like, and I love that about here, the big skies, the big open spaces that definitely appeals to that part of my character and my upbringing. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, so here you are in Des Moines and you've been doing an art beacon residency. Is that still going on? Yes. So I, um, rather than doing the usual takeover of a week or two, I sort of arranged to do one day a month purely on the basis of um, one, my art practice is still getting going. So I didn't feel like I had enough material, if you like, or work to show people uh -huh. um, for a consistent period of time. Um, two, I wanted to kind of do it as a way of, uh, getting to know people a little bit more in the community as well so obviously I've got to know a few people through the art centre and through things like Art Week and, and things like that but I know that Art Beacon stretches that a little bit further so it was just nice to think that maybe I could uh, stretch out a little bit further in that respect right. while we're getting to know people um, and the other reason was accountability actually because I thought for me, I have gone from running two businesses and working for people to having virtually no routine because I'm not allowed to work here. Um, I have pretty much had to make it up as I go along. And I'm a person that actually really likes to have routine. Um, mm. And I'm quite a motivated person. Once I get into the rhythm of something, I'm pretty good at sticking with it. But it's having something that makes that structure fall into place. And the residency kind of seemed like uh, a good way of creating accountability for making myself get a structure for, for making my art. You know, because although I want to make my art, um, you know, it's not like having a job where you go nine to five to the office, you know, you're doing that because you're earning money. I'm not earning money. I'm not going to be anytime soon. Um, I want to make my art, but it's very easy to be like, well, I'll just, I'll just sit down for a couple of hours, you know, and maybe stare out a window or something, you know, and it's like, well, that's not really that useful. I mean, sometimes it's nice, but I can't, you know, I, I need to start doing things. So it just seemed like a really good way of like, I've got to do this every month. Um, you know, hopefully people might want to see my work developing. Um, but if not, I definitely need to be seeing that there's some development. So if I'm on having to use a platform where people are expecting something of me, maybe then that's good. That's going to make me, that's just going to give me that little kick to make that's sure great. I'm doing what I need to do. Yeah, and and now that you're moving into your studio, um, the the energy is really going to start flowing well. Yeah, I ho I hope so. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you on the show today. We've had Becky Beckett. Becky, thanks a lot. Thank I you. I appreciate you sharing your time. Uh, it's been great talking to you and hearing your thoughts about yourself and art and the move here and all the newness of uh, moving into a studio and all of that good stuff. Yeah, it's exciting. I look forward to um, the things that are coming up. There, there should be some exciting stuff coming up. Yeah. Great. Well, we do have Art Week coming up. That's from June 19th to June 26th, so next week. Um, check out artweek.com to see virtual and online events uh, and use the tip jar if you see art that you like and you want to support the artists. Uh, or just buy their work. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to sell their work too. Uh, this is Dan Troxell signing off.